I just recently preached a sermon and I noted in the past that sometimes people use this verse for the topic of their sermon at a funeral. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. There are many who believe that this verse is talking about worldly death. But if you look at 2 Corinthians 7 verses 8 through 11, we can more fully understand what Jesus meant when he made that statement. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorrow, sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Godly sorrow is a very effective working tool. Producing diligence, clearing yourself, indignation, fear, vehement desire, zeal, vindication. These are the things that the Lord is talking about when he made that statement. This was on a mountain in Galilee. The greatest preacher preached the greatest sermons of all times. Jesus Christ preached the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. Took three sermons, for three chapters for that sermon. And we do 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. The first 12 verses make up the Beatitudes. In those 12 verses there are nine qualities of character. Each are introduced with blessed are. So each and every one of us can know what we know, what we need to know about being blessed by the Lord. You know when you look at the word blessed, it means consecrated, sacred, holy, sanctified, worthy of true lasting happiness, sincerity of the soul and of the mind. Blessedness comes to those who develop godly qualities in their character. These are the ones that Jesus listed for us, all nine of them. In this lesson, we're going to take time to consider the second beatitude. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, verse 4. You know, if you stop and think for a moment, these beatitudes are presented as a paradox in what appears to be a contradiction of one of the other. You know, when you think about joy of sorrow, how can you have joy in sorrow? Gladness of grief? Is that not paradoxical? Be happy with your grief? What about the bliss of being broken hearted? Do you know of any 16 year old teenager who just broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend that feels the bliss of being broken hearted? No, it doesn't happen. Most of them want to go kill themselves or die right now. I just can't make it without them. We know that that is a paradox. 
that Jesus is talking about here. When Jesus uses the word mourn, he uses it in the strongest sense that we can find it in the Bible. The same word. In the Septuagint, when it describes Jacob's grief for Joseph, we'll find that word in Genesis 37, verse 34. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. That's real grief that Jacob was feeling there. David did the same thing for his son Absalom in 2 Samuel 19 verse 1. But the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom my son, my son. Deep heartfelt grief for the loss of a son. But not all mourning is a blessedness. Not all mourning brings about what we want it to, the blessedness. You know, there are many pessimists out there that are always mourning about something. That's a worldly mourning. It has nothing to do with godly mourning. And those with injured pride, you know, they always talk about how hurt they are and how much it really bothers them. And they mourn for their pride that they have lost. What about material losses? and frustrated ambitions. You know, people mourn over the fact that somebody else got the job that they really wanted and deserved more than anybody else. What about over worldly sorrow for your sins? Most generally when there is worldly sorrow for your sins, it's, I'm sorry that I got caught. That's their worldly sorrow. They're not really sorrowing in a godly way when you think about it. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. That's 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. Godly sorrow is the thing that we're looking at when he said, blessed are they that mourn. The blessed mourning is that of a spiritual mourning. It is a true anguish of the heart for the sins that we have committed against God. Because every sin we commit is against God. Because of a love for God and a gratitude for God and for His grace, we need to have that uh, sorrow, that godly sorrow. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, long-suffering, knowing or not knowing that the goodness of God leads to your repentance. Romans 2 verse 4. Not knowing the goodness of God. How could anyone not know the goodness of God? All they have to do is look around them and see. Many people admit to sin, but they will not ever grieve for having done them. They commit them over and over. Therefore, they do not repent. And nor do they have godly sorrow for their sins. You know, only the sorry, those who are truly sorry and brokenhearted over sin, will repent and flee to Christ for salvation. Leave the worldly sin and go to Christ for salvation. That's what our instructions in the Word of God are to do. Look at the prodigal son. Luke 15, verses 11 through 20. The prodigal son found himself in a pigsty, eating the food that the pigs wouldn't even eat. And in his sorrowful and penitent heart, it led him home to his father, where he was accepted, gladly received by that father. What about Peter in Matthew 26, verse 75? Peter was sorrowful when he realized that he had denied Christ three times, just like he said he would. He truly felt godly sorrow and wept about it. We wept bitterly. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus who said to him, 
before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and he wept bitterly. We know that that was an expression of godly sorrow. You know, from these examples, we can see that only those who are conscious of the wickedness of sin will mourn their actions. Most people think sin is just, oh, a little white lie, or they're not going to miss that post-it note at work, or whatever the case may be. But only those who mourn their sins will repent and seek forgiveness. When you look at 2 Corinthians uh, 7 verses 9 and 10, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Same way with that tax collector. He was standing afar off. He wouldn't so much as raise his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. Luke 18 verse 13. He was sorry with godly sorrow. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Those people who were talking to Pentecost, talking to Peter on Pentecost, knew that they had or needed godly sorrow and they were sorry for what they did and they wanted to know what to do about it you know only the penitent will be forgiven that's what it tells us in Luke 13 verse 3 and it's repeated again in verse 5 but I tell you no unless you repent you will all likewise perish. Repentance is a requirement. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. That's Joel chapter 2 verses 12 and 13. Even under the Old Testament, godly sorrow was required. And repentance was required. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4 verses 8 through 10. Only the penitent people will be forgiven. Truly penitent. Not just worldly sorry like I'm sorry I did that. But it has to have godly sorrow attached to it. They that mourn. This means those who continuously mourn for all the sins that they have committed. Continued awareness of sin's harm and wickedness is what moves us to resist temptation to commit it again. James 4 verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, the alcoholic that wants to truly quit does not go to the bar and sit around and talk to his buddies. Because he's right there in the midst of temptation. He needs to resist that temptation to commit it again. So he needs to leave that bar and get as far away from it as he can. You know, we must take our sins seriously. So seriously that our sorrow is like the morning of one mourning for someone who has died. And we know how that feels because we've been there before. 
we know how serious sorrow can be. Also, a godly person will mourn over the sins of others. Not just his own. He's aware of how each and every soul is precious to the Lord. Know that the Lord does not want anyone to be lost. Jesus is a good example of that. When you look at Luke 19 verse 41, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Jesus wept for all those lost souls that he knew there was no salvation for. Same way with Paul. Paul said, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for the lost. How do we feel about the lost? What kind of effort do we make to help save them? Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Romans 10 verse 1. If they would just get away from Judaism and listen to Paul, they could be saved. And his prayer to God is that they would do those things. What about at Corinth? 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2, where he said, You are puffed up, and you have not rather mourned, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He's talking about the man who slept with his stepmother. Infecting the church with sin. And they didn't even pray that he would be removed from among them. They accepted it. They needed more godly sorrow. Thereby each of us must use more diligence to seek and save those who are lost. We need to care about other people. The second half of that verse is they shall be comforted. The word used is paraclesis. That means to call near. Just like you would call your child when you want to give that child a hug and show them that you love them. Look at Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is not the Lord calling you with that? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The Lord desires each and every one of us to have godly sorrow and repent of our sins and come to Him. Luke 15, verses 23-24. That's the prodigal son again. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on, him and, on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That is godly sorrow and godly repentance right there. A prime example. And his father accepted his repentance and rewarded him with a robe and a ring and welcomed him back home just as our father will do us when we repent of our sins. Hebrews 4 verses 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You know, if we're not, we don't have enough godly sorrow, we need to start thinking about praying to God and asking for forgiveness of our sins. Because each and every one of us are sinners. And we know that the Lord was tempted with the same things that we were tempted with. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Well, what is comfort? 
The Lord said he would comfort you. We can find comfort in forgiveness and in salvation. The man standing on the street corner, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other one, the publican. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18, verse 14. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, Acts 8, verse 39. The eunuch was rejoicing because his sins had been removed in the waters of baptism. There is comfort in knowing that you have access to heaven. Also, we have another example here. Now, when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. All of you recognize that as the Philippian jailer being relieved of his sins through the waters of baptism, rejoicing in the comfort that he has. They shall be comforted, is what the Lord tells us. Acts 3, verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Being comforted is being refreshed, isn't it? Repenting with godly sorrow will do this for you. You also have hope. 1 Peter 1, verse uh, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. If you have godly sorrow and you repent and you have forgiveness of your sins, there's great comfort in those words, knowing that there is a place reserved for you in the mansions that Christ wanted to go home, go home and build for us. What about for the evangelist? You know, we can find hope and joy in saving a soul, James 5, verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. What kind of conclusions can we take from this lesson? We must take sin seriously. No matter how small or how great sin is sin in the eyes of the Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6 verse 23. It's only when we mourn over our sins out of pure godly sorrow that we will repent and turn to God and ask for forgiveness. The Lord says we as erring Christians must pray to Him and ask for forgiveness. Only when we are constantly aware of the ugliness of the destruction of sin will we be vigilant against sinning. Just like that alcoholic, he has to be vigilant against drinking only when we're aware of sin's harm will we mourn for the sin of others as well as for ourselves. Blessed are they that mourn. You know, only they that mourn will be comforted with the blessings of God's grace. The question is, do you have that comfort that God gives you when you mourn for your sins? What about the forgiveness of sins? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. 
And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 8 to, uh, Acts 238. What about your assurance of hope? Are you assured that you have a place with him? Do you have hope for that? And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Hebrews 6 verse 11. What about the joy of saving others from eternal destruction? Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and from a multitude of sins. James 5 verse 20. You know, Jesus calls us through his gospel. He's calling right now. The question is, are you willing to obey? You need to always be looking for Christ to come. Your opportunity to respond is while we stand and sing.